Well, good morning. Today we begin the Christmas season, uh, but the church has a slightly different word for this season. The four weeks leading up to Christmas, uh, in the church we, we, we refer to it as the season of Advent. There's a hopefulness, a longing, and an expectancy that is a part of this season. This week I heard Tim Keller say, God was, was concerned with the pain and suffering of this world to the degree that he came to earth and experienced it himself. Speaking to how serious God was and is about the condition of this world and the condition of our hearts. So there are two themes, uh, two, two dual themes that like run on two, two sides of a, of a railroad track, two dual themes that we celebrate during the season of Advent. One, one theme you're very familiar with, the other theme you may be less familiar with, uh, at least as it relates to the season of Advent. The first theme is the theme of remembering and celebrating God's first uh, visitation here on earth. The, the first time that God, when God determined to become the God-man and come to earth. Uh, we celebrate that. We remember that. We, we, we put up the, 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 uh, the manger scenes and we have baby Jesus everywhere. And that is one theme. The second theme of the season of Advent is maybe a little bit less realized, especially at the mall. Uh, but here in church, it's good and right for us to, to remember, or to, to rather celebrate this second theme. And here's, here's what the second theme is. The second theme goes like this. Jesus came to earth once, and he's coming back again one day. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we hope in you. Our hope is in you. This thrill of hope that we, that we feel, that we experience, it's in you, Jesus, as we know you will come again one day. So, so those two dual themes, you'll hear them in our readings, in my sermons, and even in the Christmas songs, if you listen closely. Uh, many of you purchased, hold that up, Lydia. Many of you purchased the, uh, the Advent book uh, to, to use this season. Lydia's holding the, uh, the version that is for, uh, for families and also for, uh, for single ladies. Uh, this is the version for single men. Uh, most of you have that version. Some of you have this version. They're, they're almost the same, except there's like more cooking in that and more wood chopping in this version or something like that. Um, other than that, they follow the same, they follow the same pattern. Mostly on Sundays, I won't be referencing these. Um, these are for you to use in your own home, uh, for you to celebrate, for, for you to devote. Uh, we, the Caulfield family, decided 8 o'clock, starting tonight, 8 p.m., um, from December 1st, that's today, through December 24th, 8 p.m. every night, we're going to sit down on the couch uh, and chairs together, and we're going, to, we're going to go through that day's reading. Whoever's home gets to be a part of it. If you're not home, that's okay. Uh, but we're 8 o'clock every night. I would encourage you to do the same thing as a family. Decide, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning over orange juice or 8 p.m. at night before you brush your teeth, whatever. You're going to, as a family, or if you're, uh, if you're single, uh, maybe some of, you friend, some of you and your friends get together maybe on a, on a, on a phone call uh, every day. December 1st through December 24th. And we'll be doing this together as a church. I'll know you're doing it. You'll know I'm doing it. And we'll, we will remember and celebrate these themes of the Advent season. We're going to mark the beginning of this season for, for us as a church today with a, a, a liturgy, a corporate reading. We don't do that very often, but it's super cool when we get to. So I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to read together. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, it, it comes out of this, out of this book. Uh, so you can... Uh, you can a look at it later on tonight. We're going to put it on the screen for now. Um, it's real clear. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be reading the leader portion, and you join Lydia with the people. This is um, a liturgy to mark the start of the Christmas season. It, it's a liturgy to start or to mark the start of the Christmas season, and it's written by Douglas um, McKelvey. All right. 
Let's read together. As we prepare our house for the coming Christmas season, we would also prepare our hearts for the returning Christ. You came once for your people, O Lord, and you will come for us again. Though there was no room at the inn to receive you upon your first arrival, we would prepare you room here in our hearts and here in our home, Lord Christ. As we decorate and celebrate, we do so to mark the memory of your redemptive movement into our broken world, O God. Our glittering ornaments and Christmas trees, our festive carols, our sumptuous feasts. By these small tokens, we affirm that something amazing has happened in time and space. That God, on a particular night in a particular place so many years ago, was born to us, an infant king, our prince of peace. Our wreaths and ribbons and colored lights, our, our giving of gifts, our parties with friends, these have never been ends in themselves. They are but small ways in which we repeat that sounding joy first proclaimed by angels in the skies near Bethlehem. In view of such great tidings of love announced to us and to all people, how can we not be moved to praise and celebration in this Christmas season. As we decorate our tree, and as we feast and laugh and sing together, we are rehearsing our coming joy. We are making ready to receive the one who has already, with open arms, received us. We would prepare you room here in our hearts and here in our home, Lord Christ. Now we celebrate your first coming, Emmanuel, even as we long for your return. O oh, Prince of Peace, our elder brother, return soon. We miss you so. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Let's prepare our hearts now as I read from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danelle. Yes, if you look around today and you see someone with sleepy eyes or someone yawning, uh, thank them because they were here last night decorating this place. Uh, that's how you will know who they are. Uh, we were here... We were here till quite late, and uh, uh, Miracle, she, she had oversight of the whole project, but, but there were many others. Uh, if I name someone, I'll end up leaving someone else out. Uh, there were many others who worked hard, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And as I said last night, in 24 days, we can take it down. Um, <laughs> Do you feel like you're waiting on something today? Do you feel like you are waiting for something this morning? Waiting on something seems to be a theme in our lives as human beings. In fact, maybe for you, life feels like a series of seasons in which you wait on something. And then after a while, that season comes to a close, and a new season begins, and yet again, you find yourself waiting on that next thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I don't say that, describe that in, in a disparaging manner. 
we're kind of wired like that as human beings. So I think it's good and right that the Advent season marks for us a time, a period of, of waiting and, and longing. In a Christian sense, but even in a secular sense, there's this sense of longing and waiting for, for that coming big day when the presents are opened and, and cheer abounds. There's a longing, there's a waiting in our hearts. I'm going to ask you to, to, uh, to do something as I, as I do this thing out loud. If you would do this thing silently uh, in sort of a, an imaginary tablet in your mind, write down the one thing that you're waiting for right now. Don't, don't, don't speak it out loud and don't even need to write it down on a piece of paper. But that one thing that, that you are... I'm going to switch verbs here now, but they're, they're, they're synonymous. That one thing that you're hoping for. I, I know every one of you in this room, there's something right now that, that really rises to the surface. And you say, that's the one thing I'm, I'm hoping for. That's the one thing right now in this season of life that I am waiting for. So if you would just make a mental note. What is that one? And maybe if you're like me, maybe there are, Three or four things that you are hoping for, waiting for right now. You can, you can share that with someone else later. But, but for now, just keep that, keep that uh, to yourself. I, I made it just a really quick list. This isn't the most profound of lists, and so don't judge me. But I, I, wrote, I wrote some things as I was, I was writing this sermon on... I don't know, Tuesday morning, I thought, what am I hoping for? Like, this very moment in time, what am, I, what, am I, what am I hoping for? What am I waiting for? And I, I wrote, uh, I'm just being honest, like, you're going to see I'm quite a bit like you. I, I thought, I'm, I'm hoping for a stress-free Christmas. I wrote that down. And I, I, put, I put this, like, again, we're just... For all honest with one another, I put, that I don't run out of money. I put that. I actually put that down. Uh, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got two things that I'm not going to read to you because they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're private. Uh, and then I, I, I wrote down that that River Church would thrive. Write that down. And then the last thing that I wrote that morning. It's just a snapshot. These things change a bit, right? The most profound of them don't, but s some of these things change. But the last thing I wrote was that our, that our nation would be more civil and hate would lose ground in 2020. So those are the things that I wrote. Yeah, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? So, so these are the things that I am hoping for. And, and some of the profound things I didn't share, not because they're just, they're just really really personal, and I can, I'll share with you one-on-one, -on -one, but not from, the, not from up here. But, but these, are, these are very personal hopes, um, things that I'm waiting for. So I would ask you now to, to, to bring up in your mind again the thing or the things that you are you're hoping for in the next few months or this season in your life, and I would, I would ask you this question, uh, for you to answer in your own heart. Does Jesus have anything to do with those things that you were hoping for? Here, here's what I mean by that. There are things, and I'll unpack this later, but there are things that we hope for, and there are things that we hope in. For instance, I might hope for finances, resources to, to pr provide for my family and maybe to give them some nice things. I, I, I would hope for finances and resources. But on the other hand, I, I could also hope in those things. I could hope in money. I could put all of my hope in money, and that would be a tragic Mistake. You, you understand that. You would mostly agree with me, even though many of us are making that tragic mistake. We realize <laughs> that it's tragic. 
So there are things that we hope for, and there are things that we hope in, and on your list of things that you're hoping for over the next six months, over the next three years, again, my question is, does Jesus have anything to do with those hopes? Said another way, can you hope in Jesus as the source for what you were hoping for? Or, or are you on your own regarding uh, what you just listed? What you're hoping for this Christmas? Could you possibly hope in Christ to be the provider of that thing? Or is, is that just out of out of the picture? Is that not really a part of the equation? We read, uh, Donnell read today from John 1. All things were made through him. Without him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Christ is life, and in that life, we find our light. We sing this. Um, we sing this. This song. We will sing it sometime while we are. Uh, we'll sing it several times over the next four weeks, probably. Maybe in, including our Christmas Eve service. And, and this 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 Advent theme, the title of this sermon series, comes as you know from the song, a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. How many times have you sung that in your life? Probably hundreds of times, at least. I bet I've sung it, sung it more than uh, hundreds of times. A thrill of hope. Thrill and hope. Those two words, hope and thrill. Man, those are big ticket items. Are those not some of our favorite words in the English language? If I say the word thrill or I say the word hope, do, do, do those words not cause you to smile? Do, do, they not, do they not conjure up in you um, really positive emotions? I, I thought about the words, the two glorious words, thrill and hope. Hope and thrill. And I thought about hope, and this may seem sappy. I don't think I ever, ever even saw the movie, but I love the phrase "hopeful." Did anybody see this movie? It was like in 1998. Anybody see it? Yeah. Um, Harry Connick Jr. and what's her name? Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock. Yes. Hope floats. I don't know what the movie's about, but I like the idea. I like the idea that when a lot of things sink, that that hope continues to float. I don't know if that's what the movie's about or not. Uh, but hope. Uh, now I thought about the word hope again, and I thought of good old Bob Hope. And if you're younger than, if you're younger than me, you don't know who Bob Hope is. Like, I'm kind of the, like, on the tail end of Bob Hope's career. He was a, a comedian. He was a, uh, he was a star in the big picture. He was a star in the small screen, the TV. Uh, his, he was in the era, the, the war era, but then into the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, he was still around. Uh, but again, if you're if you're a little bit younger than me, you may not even know who Bob Hope is. But he's one of the he's a legend. He's a, a wonderful, wonderful comedian. So 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 Hope. I think of of of, of Bob Hope at least. Uh, and then you think of the word thrill. And uh, because I grew up uh, uh, in the seventies as a, uh, a a kid, a real a real boxing fan. I really don't follow boxing at all anymore. But I was a boxing fan, and so I still remember the fight. Uh, it was the third fight, uh, third the, the, the epic trilogy of fights between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, and it was the Thrilla in Manila. And that's what it was. See, most of you don't even know what that even means, but that's what they called it. And if you were a boxing fan or you're really kind of a sports fan at all, you, you might know that phrase. It was called the Thrilla in Manila. It was in Manila. Um, in a hot tin building. They, they had it out of the country for reasons that we won't go into. Uh, the Thriller the in Manila. Uh, 
And then the word throw. We're talking about the throw here. I'm gonna I'm gonna land this plane eventually. Uh, the the um, the word thrill. Maybe you're not a boxing fan. Maybe you're maybe you're a lover, not a fighter. In which case you would remember Thriller, right? <laughs> which is my teen years. Uh, the best album. I, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a Michael ja Jackson connoisseur, but I'll say this anyway. The best of the albums that he put out. That may or may not be true. You can correct me later. But hope and thrill, thrill and hope. The fact is we live in a world that is desperate for hope. You work and live among a people, your friends, who will pay good money for a thrill. Because, because we, are, we are generally a, a, a hopeless people. And, and we are generally, humanity, a people who lives uh, this, this low-grade level of boredom. But the idea that something might possibly happen, happen that would bring a thrill of hope, well, that should light our fire. And, and as Christians, that is a Christian ethic, that, that Jesus, he brings a thrill of hope. If you've bought into some brand of Christianity or, or some brand of legalism or, or r religiosity that, 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 that causes you to remain bored and hopeless, that, that, is not, that is not the Christ of the Bible. Advent, this is the season of hope. And we all have, a, we all, whether or not we're, we're really following Jesus, we all have a level of expectancy this season. You, you may expect, like, this, this, will, this will be a great family season. Or maybe your expectancy, uh, your, your, what you're expecting of this, maybe it's, I will get what I want. Or, or maybe it's, I will finally get what I want. See, we're living out our, our expectancies. We're, we're living out our, our hopefulness right now, this morning, right here together. We're all, every one of us, we're hoping in something and we're hoping for lots of things. And so into, this, into the darkness of this world, the light of Jesus has come. That's what, that's what John 1 says. And and darkness could not and cannot overwhelm or overcome that light. So if you are, if you are living in darkness right now, and, and the Bible is true, then, then the light of Christ, when it finally penetrates your heart, when it overcomes you, your darkness, the darkness of your life, doesn't stand a chance. The month of December is is the uh, it's it's the darkest time of the calendar year. The days are short. Uh, darkness stays longer than 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 is expected each day. And and I want to uh, give you um, some freedom and some permission to to wrestle with your own emotions and and maybe the low grade sort of depression that that you maybe are feeling just the blues that you're feeling. I think maybe sometimes we overthink that and we overcomplicate that during the season and we decide that it, it that that uh, it, it's that it's that darn baby in the manger. You're making me sad again. Um, you know, it may just be the weather. Uh, the days are short. I kind of get the blues this season. Maybe you're experience, experiencing um, some, some sort of like the dark night of the soul right now, today. Um, maybe you felt it on Friday after Thanksgiving when it's kind of the letdown after Thanksgiving. Maybe that's you. Um, 
what I want you to do, what I want to invite you to do this season, and I'm going to do it as well, is let's explore that. Let's, let's look at the Advent season and the hope and the expectancy that we can place on Christ. And let's, let's, let's discover together, like this season, rather than hoping in the best Christmas ever or, or that my, my in-laws and relatives will finally get along or whatever. Uh, this, this season, I'm going to take all the pressure off that and I'm going to place my hope in Christ and, and see how that works. The world is weary. May the weary world um, right on our doorstep. May the weary world rejoice this season. Now, if we're going to put our hope in something, or as I'm encouraging you to do, if we're going to put our hope in someone, Jesus Christ, his name, his fame, if we're going to, if we're going to hope in something, then, then that something must be reliable. If you're going to hope in it, it would be insane to hope in something that is less than reliable. Yet all of us do that, don't we? Every one of us have, have, have at times put our hope in someone who is less than reliable. Or in something that was going to rot or break or be taken away certainly wasn't reliable to the end. In fact, no one and no thing is really reliable always to the end. Everything breaks. So, so we, if we're thinking straight, if we are healthy, we hope only in things that will be reliable, that we can count on. And the problem is that's a really, really short list. Again, by... By review, I said a few minutes ago, we, we hope for things, and, and we, we hope in things, and the difference between hoping for and hoping in, it's significant. And when we, when we hope for, I'm sorry, when we hope in things that we should really only hope for, um, it's it's tragic. It's it's devastating. I'm going to give you some examples. Um, unreliable things that we hope too much in. These are things that you can hope for, but they're not reliable to the degree that you can hope in them. Just a quick list. One would be the economy. Whatever that means for you, the, the stock market, or getting your house paid off, getting your car paid off, getting your rims paid off, whatever. Uh, we, we, we can hope for those things, but they're unreliable. You hope in them, and it breaks. Your job. My job, your vocation, what you've decide to, to, decided to do to make money, your gainful employment. We should hope for a job. Some of you are hoping for a job this Christmas season. So some of you are hoping uh, for a new job. And that's good and that's, that's right. But when we hope in our jobs, my job defines me. My, my personality, my self-esteem, my self-worth, it's all wrapped up in my job. I hope in my job. And then what happens? You don't get that promotion or you, you're demoted or you are, uh, your salary's cut or you're fired. Uh, and, and what happens? It just, it just cuts against the grain of how you define yourself because you went, to, you went from hoping for a job to hoping in a job. What are you hoping for this season? What are you hoping in this season? Uh, another, another example of something that, that's unreliable, and yet we attempt to hope in it. It would be leisure and fun. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's uh, 
a home remodeling project or putting in a swimming pool or uh, going to the Bahamas. And, and it's, it's, it's fine to hope for those things, but, but when we hope in them, they break. The last example I would give, which is probably the most tragic, and that is often we put our hope in a spouse. Maybe, maybe a... Uh, Maybe a future spouse, maybe your current spouse, maybe your next spouse, uh, and we hope in, oh, one day he will make me happy. One day she will fulfill all of my dreams. You see, the, the, the tragedy is this. When we take something that's good and we make it God, like money or finances or your spouse, when we take something that, that can only bear a little bit of weight and we put all the weight that only God can handle, we put all that weight on there, I'm hoping in you, husband, I'm hoping in you, wife, what happens? We just, we just crush it because no one can bear that weight because no one and no thing is super reliable all the time, save Jesus. Now, Jesus can bear that weight. So I thought it would be good for the reign of our time this morning to talk about this. How how is Jesus a reliable source in whom we can hope? Because here's, here's what I have come to believe, folks. The, the reason that we don't hope in Christ, it's, it's, it's not because uh, we think that, uh, it's, not, it's not because we don't, we don't know that we're supposed to. Like the, the, the most, the, most the, the, the youngest, most, I'll say, immature Christian, someone who's just, just decided to follow Christ and just barely come to, to be a part of the community of faith, we, we all, we know. I know I'm to trust in Jesus. I, I know that I'm to hope in Jesus and not all this stuff. It, our problem isn't, isn't a lack of knowledge. We, we know that. And, and, and neither is our problem uh, that we think that things, other things are actually better than Jesus. I mean, he's the king of the universe. Like, if that's true... You know, he like owns everything for eternity. Like he's the guy you'd go to for a loan. Like, like if, if it, it's not, it, the, the problem isn't that we think, actually believe that other things, other stuff would be better than Jesus. I, I really don't think that's, that's our problem either. I don't think our problem is like, I think, well, you know, like, like a new motorcycle, that'd be better than Jesus. You know, or... You know, or the best vacation in the world, or, you know, whatever it is that you, you know, like your, like that would be better than Jesus. I don't think that we, th that we really believe that stuff is better than Jesus. I think this is our problem. We think Jesus is a liar. We, we don't really believe that Jesus is reliable. And I can only do a little bit of a little bit to help you with that. Really, mostly, in fact, I suppose totally, the Holy Spirit is going to need to change that in your heart. I'm merely a tool in the Holy Spirit's hand to help you kind of think through, think through some of your uh, misbeliefs. But anyway, so five reasons uh, that Jesus is a reliable source in whom we can trust. Unlike everything else that we trust in that is unreliable. This is the first one. Jesus is the source of everything. This means that he, he is the creator God. He's the one that you would go to for anything, for everything. He has it all. Uh, he is the source of everything. 
we, we read this earlier. We read this earlier, John 1, verse 3. All things were made through him. That's, that's Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. I mean, that's the guy you want to know, right? Like, he's the one you want to know. He's the one you want to go to. He's the one. You, you, want, to, you want to have his number on your cell phone. You want, you want, to, you want to be in good with him uh, because he owns it all. He's the source of everything. There's not a thing made, created, that wasn't made, created by Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, um, Peter's preaching, and Peter refers to Jesus as the author of life. Simple, simple, basic uh, theologic, theological lesson. Some of you are kind of brand new to the faith. Jesus wasn't created. Jesus didn't show up on the scene later on whenever, uh, whenever Mary was, 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 was going to have a baby. Jesus has existed eternally with God the Father, with God the Holy Spirit. He is God. But he is God incarnate, which means he is God become the God-man. He's the author of life. He's the source of everything. That's the first reason why he is reliable, unlike anybody else you know. Second reason why Jesus is a reliable source He's not only the, the source of everything, he is the sustainer of everything. He is the supporter of everything. You've probably had this thought before. I, I've had this thought before. If, if God were ever to just pull his hand away, like everything would just collapse in his absence. He would never do that. That will never happen. But, 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 but God, he is the supporter. And the Bible tells us that, that, that Jesus, as God, Jesus is the sustainer of everything. Hebrews 12 says this. Looking to Jesus, the founder, that means he got it all started, and the perfector, of our faith. Another word would be sustainer. He keeps it going. He keeps it afloat. Looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus. He is the sustainer, the supporter. Philippians 1 says the same thing in slightly, slightly different words. It says that Jesus, I'm sure of this, Paul says, I'm sure of this, that, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. What, what God has started in your life, God will finish in your life. The creator God is the sustainer God. He will get you through this. And not just through the next 90 or 100 years, He will get you through eternity. He will carry you. He will sustain you. He will support you. A passage that we've looked at a lot over the last month, I'm not going to project it, but 1 Peter 3, or 1, 3, says that, that, that God has given us everything required for life and godliness. The second reason that, that Jesus, he's a reliable source. Uh, he's a reliable source in whom we can hope. Second reason is that he is the sustainer, not just the creator, but the sustainer of everything that exists. Nothing would continue to exist 
except that Jesus sustains those things. Third, third reason that Jesus is a reliable source for us to hope in is this. Jesus is the king for eternity. You know, we tend to, we tend to caricature that or make that into a kid's uh, picture book. Nothing wrong with that. I like kids' picture books. But, but, but let's really think deeply on what that means. Jesus is king. Kanye West says so, right, in the album that he just put out. Um, I'm going give, to give due props. Uh, but, but more importantly, much more importantly, um, scriptures tell us that Christ is king. Revelation 17. Check this story out. The Lamb is Jesus. They, all of, all, all of, of the evil uh, forces that exist, they will make war on the Lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them. For He is Lord of Lords. He's the Lamb. And He's the Lord of Lords. And He's the King of Kings. Those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Oh, that that might be us. Oh, that you might be those who are with him. That you might be those who are called and chose, are called, called and chose, uh, sorry, are called chosen and faithful. Oh, that might be, oh, that that might be true of you. Oh, that that might be true of me. This is the third reason why Jesus is reliable. Because he is king for eternity. Jesus said this of himself. Jesus said so himself that he's a king. Pilate said to Jesus when he was supposedly a captive, Pilate said to him, so are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king for this purpose I was born for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. This is, all five of these reasons are, are significant. Maybe, maybe I would call this the most significant reason that Jesus is a reliable source in whom you can hope because he is the king of the universe for eternity. Let me ask you, does someone else own you? They will only own you for a season. Does someone else, does someone else own your heart? They will only own your heart for a season. But Jesus is a reliable source in whom you can hope because he is king for eternity. He will reign and rule over the righteous, over all of existence for eternity. Anyone, anyone else that you're attempting to please? Uh, anyone else that you're attempting to impress? Anyone else in whom you are attempting to hope? They will only have sway over you for a season. But Jesus, for eternity, is your king. Jesus made this bold claim. Jesus said, I am the king. And he cannot be, he cannot be marginalized. We do this in society. Maybe, maybe some of your, maybe, maybe you do this. And I, I, res I respect your, your opinions, but I want to point out the illogic in this opinion. And that is, we marginalize Jesus as simply a good teacher. 
a good man, a man with solid ethics, a generous man, a, the, the greatest of all rabbis, an inspiring teacher. Jesus cannot be marginalized like that. His claims were too bold. And that leads us to the, 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 fourth, the fourth reason that, that, that Jesus is a reliable source in whom you can trust, and that is this. Jesus is either completely reliable or he's a liar. He, he cannot be he cannot be anything less than completely reliable because he told he tells us that he is completely reliable. Jesus made two bold claims. Um, Jesus claimed number one to be God. And Jesus claimed, uh, number two, that he would defeat death. That he would, you know, you'll, you're going to destroy this temple. But three, year, three days later, it's going to be fine. It's going to be built back up. And, and people, some people missed it. They didn't understand the cryptic nature of what he was saying. But Jesus there and several other places said, I will defeat death. I will overcome death. I will walk out of the tomb. So see, there's no middle ground. Jesus can't just be somewhat reliable. Jesus can't just be true to some of his claims. Either he is completely reliable or he's a liar. That's why I, I say all the time, and I'll say it again today, you're skeptic, you're wondering what, 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 you know, what's this whole church thing about or what do I believe about religion. I would, I would say start with the tomb and determine whether or not Jesus really defeated the death. He really walked out of the tomb because he said he would, and the Bible says he did, and you may not believe that, and, and you have that right, um, you have that freedom, but if he didn't walk out of the tomb, what do we care what the rest of the Bible says? Because Jesus lied about that. On, on the other hand, if Jesus walked out of the tomb, he's king of the universe. And he's a completely reliable source. And he is a, he is a truth teller like none other. And we can rely on him. Number five, the last reason that Jesus is a reliable source in whom we can trust. Jesus is powerful in matters that leave me powerless. The idea of being powerless is very counterintuitive. It's a very counterintuitive position to... Uh, to take or to admit um, in, today's, in today's culture, especially being weak is not in vogue, right? It's less popular than it has ever been. And you may say, well, it's never been popular. And I would challenge that notion. Being, being weak and being simple and being reliant um, is found many places in the Bible, but it is as I said, it's it's gone out of vogue. It's very it's very um, counterintuitive these days. But do you know that that, that that it's spoken of in Scripture that we are to uh, celebrate and uh, em embrace our weaknesses. Now, now it's good and right for us at times to it's good it, it's it's good and right for us at times to say you know. Um, in this scenario, I'm not powerless. Like, God has given me freedom. God has given me um, strength. And, 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 and I, I find my power in the Holy Spirit. And, and that is true. We're not, we're not completely powerless all the time. But we do find ourselves to be powerless at times. And that's where Jesus shines the brightest. That's where he, he really comes through. 2 Corinthians 12 says this. Uh, this is Paul. Paul was struggling with some ailment or some physical illness or some um, some difficulty to call the, the the thorn in his flesh, um, um, but 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 Jesus said to me, that's what Paul is saying. But Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your uh, in weakness. So that's what Jesus told him. Jesus said, look. 
My grace, it's enough for you. And, and dear friends, Jesus is saying this to you this morning. My, my grace, Jesus said, it's, it's, it's enough. It's sufficient. It will, it will carry you. It will win the day. Um, my, my, my grace is sufficient. My power is actually made perfect, Jesus says, in your weakness. Like your weakness, my weakness, it's like fertile ground in which Christ's power can grow. And then, in quotes, and Paul goes on and says, therefore, this is Paul, the greatest missionary that ever lived. Paul, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I'll admit my weaknesses. Some of us don't admit our weaknesses at all. I, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content. I'm content with weakness. I'm content with insults. I'm content with hardships and persecutions and calamities. I'll, I'll find contentment in that. Why? Uh, because when I am weak, then I'm strong. You see, I, I always want to be in control. Maybe you're like that. I... I I want to be in control of my own destiny. I want to be in control of everything. I want to be in control of everybody. But Christ comes along. This is a Christian teaching. If you're a Christ follower, then, then you, are, you must submit yourself to this ethic, this teaching. Jesus says, no, no, understand. When you're weak... I move in and I become your strength. When you suffer insults, when you become, when you uh, come face to face with your weaknesses, when you when you uh, go through hardships, when you are persecuted, when calamity knocks at your door, Jesus says, "I will move in. I'll move into the house. I'll care for you. You'll be weak." I will be your strength. My grace is sufficient. Someone really hurt me this week with his words. And that's, that's a part of being a pastor. Um, that doesn't make it right, but it makes it part of being a, that is part of being a pastor. But somebody really hurt me this week. And I realized... I realized that I can't fix people. Like I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I'm, uh, I'm unable to fix your heart. Um, but in the midst of my, my, my weakness that day, I realized that Christ flows through me. I, I'm merely an agent. A a representative of God's grace. And that's my role. And, and folks, that's your role. That's what Jesus says. My grace is sufficient for you. In, in your weakness, I'll be strong. So, I invite you as we prepare to go to the table of communion today, I invite you to, to embrace two things. I invite you, number one, to embrace your frailty. It's real. It's right there in front of you. Um, it's okay to embrace it. And then I invite you to embrace, number two, Jesus' strength. Although we may hope in Christ this season. Let's pray.